Rotator cuff tear imaging. The imaging are usually x-rays, MRI, ultrasound, or a CT. We will get x-rays for the patient. We will get a true AP view, will show us the acromiohumeral interval, which is about 7 to 14 millimeter. The x-ray may show you proximal migration. It means a chronic cuff tear. It also, the x-ray can show you calcific tendinitis. We also get the supraspinatus outlet view. It will show us the acromion shape, whatever it's a flat, type 1, curved, type 2, or hogged, type 3. It can also show us the os. The x-ray view will show an os acromion. We will order an MRI, which is the best study for diagnosing rotator cuff tear. The MRI takes slices or cuts of the bone and the soft tissue structures as you're taking slices from an apple and you can see the inside of the apple. The slices of the MRI can be seen in a coronal, sagittal, or axial orientation. I have another video on that subject and you can see it if you want to. Here is the link. The normal rotator cuff appears dark on T1 and T2. Arthrogram is not used routinely, but you will use it if you are unable to do an MRI, like somebody have a pacemaker. So you do arthrogram of the shoulder. The same thing like if the patient have a pacemaker and you can't do an MRI in the spine, then you get myelogram. Arthrogram will show extravasation of the dye into the subacromial space. And if you have the geyser sign, means the dye leaks into the subacromial space and the AC joint, that means it's a huge tear. If you add MRI to the arthrogram, that will increase the sensitivity and the specificity. It will show also any instability and it may show partial tears better. When it comes to the MRI, the T2 is probably the best in showing the tears. The problem with MRI is the presence of asymptomatic cuff tears that is seen frequently in patients, especially the people that are older. Like 50% of asymptomatic patients 60 years or older will show tears on an MRI. These tears increase in frequency with age. Age is important with cuff tears because of few things. Number one, a lot of asymptomatic tears. Number two, if you are above the age of 40 and you dislocate the shoulder, you may have a cuff tear. Number three, in older patients, you will find chronic tears that could involve multiple tendons. Number four, the outcome of rotator cuff repair depends on the age. The older the patient, the worse the outcome. Number five, older patient with cuff tear arthropathy can have a reverse shoulder, which is different than younger patient. So older patients got problems when it comes to cuff tear. When you look at the MRI, you want to know the type of the tear. Is it partial or complete? You want to know the size. Is it a small, medium, or large tear? Is it a massive tear? Rotator cuff tears are classified into partial thickness or full thickness tears. The partial thickness are classified by location into three types. Articular side, or bursal side, 
or intrasubstance partial tear, and also classified according to the size, greater or less than 50% thickness. The fluid or the dye will extend partially through the thickness of the tendon, but there is no retraction of the tendon. And then the other type is the full thickness tear, which is complete tear. The fluid bright signal extends completely through the tendon from superior to inferior. You want to know how much retraction that tear has. Massive tears of the rotator cuff that are greater than 5 cm usually involves multiple tendons. The tendon will be retracted to the level of the glenoid and will be atrophy of the muscle with fatty infiltration and probably superior migration of the head of the humerus. You want to know the quality of the muscle if you have some fatty atrophy on sagittal view. Sagittal view will be the best view to show you the fatty atrophy. Normally, the supraspinatus muscle occupies the fossa in the sagittal view. And when the muscle is atrophied or abnormal, it doesn't occupy the fossa completely. It doesn't fill it. When you see the fatty muscle atrophy on the sagittal view, that means either you have a chronic rotator cuff tear or subloscapular nerve injury. So if it is zero, it will be normal. One would be some fatty streaks. Stage two more muscle than fat, stage 3 equal fat and muscle, stage 4 more fat than muscle. It is better to know the location of the muscles in the sagittal view. You need to get the proper orientation and know the exact location of the muscles in the sagittal view. In the sagittal view, you need to locate the supraspinatus and you need to locate the subscabularis, and on the other side, you need to locate the infraspinatus and the teres minor. Then you need to look at the biceps. Usually you do that in an axial cut to see if any subluxation of the biceps that could mean subscabularis tear, especially the superior part of the subscabularis. Remember, the biceps is anteriorly located. Also look for cysts on the greater tuberosity on the MRI, which is seen in a lot of patients with rotator cuff tear. How about the CT arthrogram? You do it sometimes when the case is post-operative and the patient have anchors and you can't see, but a lot of people think that ultrasound is better in these cases. Ultrasound is used with frequency. It's not expensive. It can create dynamic evaluation, but it needs a learning curve, and it cannot evaluate the shoulder joint itself. And there is about 20% of the patient will have a cuff tear in asymptomatic patients. Thank you very much. I hope I was helpful.